Of course, yeah. So my name is Jennifer Carroll. Um, I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Elon University in North Carolina in the United States. Um, and my new book is called Narcomania. It's um, been put out by Cornell University Press. Um, it's uh, they've they've exceeded my expectations in that this wasn't supposed to be released until June fifteenth, and I'm already receiving. Uh, Loving text messages from friends who said that they've seen it in 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 the, the papery flesh, as it were, at different conferences. Um, so the book is the result of uh, several years of research in Ukraine. <clears throat> um, I started working um, on questions of HIV and HIV prevention. I'm a medical anthropologist by training um, and uh, have a lot of um, experience working in harm reduction in the United States, especially before and during going to grad school and in, and in college. And I was really interested in how some of the, uh, the programs that were designed in places ranging from Seattle, San Francisco, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, even parts of the Netherlands were getting translated into the Ukrainian context uh, because there were, there's obviously very different understandings of um, you know the social life and individuality and responsibility and, and even just medicine and the body is, is different so I started exploring how some of the programs that exist for treating opioid use disorder or reducing the risk of infection or overdose or other injury um, for people who use drugs were getting implemented in Ukraine one of the first places that I had the opportunity to visit was an NGO in Odessa and I remember thinking that if there wasn't Russian in the posters on the walls, I wouldn't know that I wasn't in Chicago or, or Vancouver or some, something else. Um, so that's, that's how the book began. And the final product ultimately is a look at how those organizations, especially the internationally funded ones, the ones that are getting funded by the Global Fund, um, sometimes even the Elton John Foundation, the whole swath of international orgs, um, how those organizations in Ukraine are playing into the political landscape. Um, I look at how the social imagination of people who use drugs, so not, not the individuals themselves, but what the rest of us imagine in our brains when we think about a person who uses drugs, how that imagination gets rolled into different narratives. And so um, the first half of the book is a look at, at clinics and record keeping and accountability and all these things. And then the last half of the book deals with uh, the Maidan revolution, with Crimea, with the Donbass war, um, even that guy Darth Vader who keeps running for mayors of things, um, because it turns out that discussions and imaginations of substance use are actually really central to all of those topics. So um, it's a, it's very popular to say that Ukraine has one of the largest HIV epidemics in Europe and Central Asia. Um, the the precision of that statement fluctuates from year to year, um, but it is true that the uh, population rate is relatively high. I think relatively is an important word here. Um, the last time um, I was able to lay hands on an estimate that was uh, really skillfully done that I trusted, the estimation was actually brought down. So currently, I believe the the, the standard understanding is that 0.8% of the population of Ukraine um, is currently living with HIV. So that sounds very small um, compared to, say, most places in North America, that's astonishingly high um, compared to certain places um, where the HIV, HIV epidemic has been rampant for many decades, that's very, very low. Um, what I think is important to know is that that epidemic has historically been situated in people who use drugs. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Part of it has to do with the culture of drug use. Part of it has to do with different technologies. Like it actually does matter um, how, what route of transmission you use or what route of um, consumption you use for, for drugs. Like the, the specific syringe actually matters quite a lot when it comes to um, the risk of, of spreading bloodborne diseases. Um, but but it's important to know that that epidemic has largely been concentrated in people who use drugs, and right now the driving forces of new HIV infection in Ukraine are um, uh, injection drug use and um, sexual contact, especially with people who are involved in the drug sex economy. Um, I believe just recently heterosexual contact has overtaken injection drug use as the um, most uh, prominent cause of new HIV infection, um, but it's still very, very much concentrated in that group. And so that's why a lot of these international organizations were um, funding programs to provide treatment, uh, to provide methadone and to provide buprenorphine, which are very effective evidence-based medical treatments for opioid use disorder in Ukraine because the idea is if you can, if you meet someone who's interested in treatment and you can get them on treatment and get them stabilized, 
and they're no longer craving or engaging in drug use, then that person is not going to be engaged in disease transmission, right? You're removing them from, uh, from that network. So the more people you could do that with, the more you're going to slow down the spread of these diseases. Um, the last good estimate that I saw of the prevalence of HIV among people who use drugs in Ukraine is several years old at this point, but I believe it's about 22 to 23 um, percent, which is higher. It, it, it's This is a phrase that was used a bit in the book, and it's it's a bit of a, a flashy phrase, but for folks who are not terribly familiar with the epidemic, that is higher than in most regions of sub-Saharan Africa. Right? So it's, it's an extremely, extremely high rate of HIV among people who use drugs. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's also an epidemic that came a bit late. Um, so many parts of the world saw their first HIV epidemics in the 80s. Um, Ukraine didn't see many of their first cases until the late 90s. So it's been an infrastructure that has, um, they've had to sort of build the plane as it was taking off, so to speak. Um, so I... Uh, I love my job, if I could just say that. I have met some of the most wonderful, fascinating, intelligent, interesting people throughout um, the work that I've had the privilege of doing in Ukraine. Um, it's been it's been a real it's been a real privilege. So the research largely consisted of um, building contacts within the both the medical sphere and in the nonprofit sphere. There's actually a very large, um, well, actually they're not so large, they just do an awful lot, but there's a very prominent organization called the HIV AIDS Alliance of Ukraine. Um, they're uh, headquartered in Kiev and they have been the primary recipient of global fund monies for um, more than a decade now in Ukraine. Very interesting that they were actually selected by the Global Fund to be the primary recipient of all of those money. Like we're talking tens of millions of dollars every single year um, to to help contract out to clinics and build up harm reduction and build up um, you know methadone and buprenorphine treatment and, and things like that. They were given this money after the Ministry of Health was uh, disenfranchised, so to speak. So, um, so the research involved talking to uh, clinicians, going to visit some of the methadone clinics, meeting some of the people in the nonprofit organizations that help keep these clinics off the ground. Um, sometimes I spent long periods of time in those places. So there's a particular um, methadone clinic on the left bank in Kiev that I spent um, a long summer at almost every single day, hanging out in the courtyard, um, having my backgammon game. Um, brutally critiqued by some of the people who are much, much better than me, um, and understanding how the clinic runs, meeting individuals, doing individual interviews. Other places I was really only able to visit um, for a short time. Uh, I had the privilege of going with um, a, a fellow who is a technical assistant or a consultant for a lot of different organizations doing professional development, helping them keep their books and, and all these sorts of things. Um, he was doing site visits all across southern Ukraine and I had the privilege of going with him to clinics um, in uh, Mykolaiv, in Odessa, in Kherson, um, in Crimea, um, Simferopol and Sevastopol and, um, and several other places. So, so some folks I was able to come in and go uh, for several days at a time and then there was actually a wonderful, wonderful clinic in Odessa that I went to um, multiple times. Um, um, and it was a, a beautiful, beautiful hospital uh, campus, I guess you could say, where, you know, even though one does not think about tuberculosis wards in Ukraine as the happiest places in the world, it was, you know, built to be open, it was green, there was a park on the inside, there were cats everywhere that definitely felt like they owned the place, um, people were terribly friendly and wonderful. Um, yeah, so, so it was a really, really fantastic, fantastic experience. <laughs> Once you kind of understand the nuances of the culture um, and and the sort of policy environment and physical environment in which they live and operate, um, the, the stigma is not ultimately that complicated. You can say a lot of nuanced things about it, but um, the way it manifests is never hugely surprising. What did surprise me, though, were, were things that I picked up not through my research directly, but simply by virtue of living in Ukraine for years at a time. Um, and that was, I remember I, I rented an apartment um, very near Palat Ukraina in Kiev on um, Chivano Amiska. And there was right in front of my building, I was like, they were ready for me. They knew I was coming. Right in front of my building, was a big um, advertising billboard um, and it had an ad that was uh, I believe it was sponsored by the Ministry of Health but it it said um, you know Vahidye, like there is an exit or or something to that nature and it was an illustration of individuals in a dark dank space it was a very sort of like 
uh, like noir sort of sort of illustration, and it had you know a girl in a short skirt, and it had someone drinking vodka out of the bottle, and there was smoke everywhere. What smoke of what? We don't know. The imagination reels, right? And it was clearly this like den of drugs and sex and hedonism sort of thing that this image that was evoked and then behind everyone there was an open door and it said it had one of those signs on it so like a green exit sign and beyond everyone um on the outside it was bright it was sunny there was green grass and people were playing football Right. And there was one individual who was like making making the transition from this like dark, dank place into reality. And that was, I think, the first introduction that I had into how deeply the notion of substance use of any kind, whether that substance is alcohol or or illicit drugs, marijuana, anything else, opium, shirka, um, how much that is built into the social imagination of what a good person is and what social cohesion is. Um, because it, it was an interesting idea, right? That while you're over here being, being bad and existing in this dark, dank place where everything is sad and terrible, like everyone else is outside on the soccer pitch and, you know, and, and you could come, you come join us. And I actually saw reverberations of that so many places throughout um, the the major events of 2013, 14, and 15. Um, I, I still remember the very first time on my dad when I saw a sign that said, you know, like, not come on, you know, like are not welcome in this particular place. You know, and I and I started thinking about it, and I was like, you know, a lot of these rules um, would technically. I don't think anyone's going around with like a sign on their front, but it would technically bar individuals who are receiving treatment for opioid use disorder, right? People who are kind of inarguably doing the really hard work of trying to confront their um, physical challenges, their emotional challenges, their psychological challenges, and reintegrate into society. Um, I saw so many people throughout my research who would say the exact same things that were coming out of people's mouths on my down, like, we just want to live a normal life, I want to be a daughter, I want to be a husband, I want to help my parents, I want to raise my daughter, I want a job, my dream is to have a car, <laughs> you know, like, like I, I, they wanted to be involved in all these roles, and yet by virtue of some of the choices they had made, they were sort of barred from that forever in the social imagination. Um, and, and not just barred, but deemed ineligible for for that sort of participation um and it stood out to me how much i heard words like narcoman a drug user um rab or slave like spiritual slave um uh bidlo, cattle <laughs> things like that um used uh, and and zombie zombiravani you know like used interchangeably true and truly interchangeably like when someone was going off on a rant they they picked this word and they picked that adjective and this one and it was just a mess and i was like wow okay so so someone who uses drugs is seen as equivalent as rab a spiritual slave someone who has no soul who has no personal compass no direction no motivation is seen as the same as a zombie as someone who has no mind no agency no capacity to act on their own um and as cattle someone who follows what's in front of them so if the imagination of people who use drugs is a thoughtless, brainless, heartless, soulless person who can be led on to do nefarious things, well, then of course that seems like the, the greatest of all evils, right? That's certainly not the reality, but that's the imagination. And that's how I think, I think that was, that was the big aha moment where I was like, this is not just about these individuals who are, you know, doing their own personal work in their lives, really these individuals and the organizations that help them cannot help but being caught up in these narratives about what is good and what is bad for society, which ex existed before them and now exists outside of them. So um, I know that there have been some changes, and I think that the credit for those changes really go to um, some of the organizations who have been um, tirelessly lobbying and advocating for it a long time, including the network of people who live with um, uh, HIV in Ukraine and the HIV AIDS Alliance of Ukraine, um, both uh, headquartered in Kiev, I believe. Um, they've done a ton of work. And so one of the things that has happened, which I think is really remarkable, is that the um, Ukrainian government in 2016 committed to providing funds for medications for addiction treatment in Ukraine. So since um, they first became available in the mid-2000s, all of the programs, the, the methadone, the buprenorphine, the doctors, the light bulbs, the water bills, everything has been covered by the Global Fund, 
for HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, and the Global Fund has been giving Ukraine some of the largest trenches of money to fight HIV um, in its entire portfolio. I think there was one year that only um, HIV treatment in Kenya like out out budgeted Ukraine. Um, so enormous amounts of money and they have been sort of consistently pushing, towing this line of country ownership of like, okay, you know, at some point Ukraine, you have to, you know, support your own programs, things like that. It can be a bit of a, um, intimidating prospect, right, that an international organization has come in and set up all of these institutions and all of these programs that are very expensive and are like, great, now you take it over, you know, and so historically, um, the Ministry of Health has responded by um, recoiling from, <laughs> from that threat and doing things to limit access to medications for addiction treatment, because the fewer people that, that are in them, the fewer people receiving those services, the less expensive that they are. Um, since Ulana Supreme came on board, um, you know, I do not know of her involvement in the decision for the government to start supporting um, doing more to support methadone and buprenorphine treatment, though I would be um, uh, not at all be surprised to learn that she had uh, a, a hand in that particular decision. And I know that she's been doing a lot of things to um, support general health reform, um, things like changing the, the finance structure and changing access to different primary care um, providers, and that's all been really, really wonderful. Um, I think what I would offer to her... Um, which in all likelihood is something that she already knows and and I would love to be able to sit down, you know, with a couple of beers between me and Dr. Zaprun and pick her brain about how are you prioritizing all of the things that you would like to accomplish in Ukraine, because I'm sure the list is enormous. Uh, but I think the ending some of the, the siloing of those different programs and of those different clinics is important. Um, I understand how a... Um, a reasonable person who was trying to plan a large healthcare system was like, that's where we'll treat cancer. That's where we'll treat HIV. That's where, you know, and, and that's sort of what the system still looks like. And I think a major um, barrier to improving the kind of treatment that people receive still comes from siloing these things where you have to go to uh, like a narcology center or something like that, or, or even to an HIV hospital or to a tuberculosis hospital to receive these things. You know, every single one of these things, HIV, tuberculosis, and substance use are all deeply stigmatized in Ukraine. So it's sort of, um, you know, not even really a choice, like which one of these places, which, which sign over the door that you walk in every day, do you want to be there? Um, so I think integrating those things more into, into general care would be very, very helpful. Um, the other thing that has happened, which I think is really, really wonderful, um, and again, I would be very surprised to learn that Dr. Supreme was not a part of this, um, is office-based buprenorphine therapy. So the biggest challenge for individuals who are receiving medication for addiction treatment um, in Ukraine, in the United States, literally anywhere I've been in the world where I've seen these programs operating, is the fact that they are quote unquote chained to the clinic. And this, um, this I believe that this strategy began in the United States. I believe it's specifically a, a drug enforcement agency, a US DEA policy um, focused on diversion control that if you are prescribing methadone, for opioid use disorder, as opposed to all the other things that methadone is good for. It's actually quite good for pain, um, you know, different things like that. Um, you have to go to the clinic. You can't go to a pharmacy and take it home with you and get a two-week supply or a 30-day supply. You have to go to the clinic every day and have a nurse literally watch you take it. Um, I met some folks, unfortunately, this clinic is no longer open, but I met some folks in um, outside of Sevastopol who were commuting three hours a day to get to their clinic and then three hours back that's that's bonkers like you how can you live your life right um and part of the reason why i find that problematic is not just that um that you know personal inconvenience but because we have no evidence that that's helpful that's not an evidence-based policy we don't have any studies that tell us that it is somehow more helpful somehow more therapeutic somehow more effective or efficacious to deliver care in this way um we have a lot of physicians intuition which should be listened to that says, you know, when people are coming in from a really unstable situation um, and, and are trying to like separate themselves 
having a schedule is helpful, right? Having a, something to do, but within even the people that I interviewed in Ukraine were like, hey, when I first started coming here, I had just been running around all day. I'd already lost my job. My mom had already kicked me out. And so like having this tight schedule to do every day was helpful. But um, after a few months of that, you're like, how can I get a job? How can I tell my boss that I need to take two hours to lunch to run down to the clinic and take methadone and come back? So being able to offer that out of primary care offices where people can go to the pharmacy and just take it home and then live their normal lives um, is key. And so there's actually a fellow at Yale, Rick Altis, who has been doing a lot of um, pilot trials around this in Ukraine. Of course, it's hugely effective. Shocker, right? You you, you make medication easier to access, more people access it and, and take it better. Um, and I believe that, that the, the policy environment to to permit that kind of office-based treatment exists in Ukraine. It's just a matter of regional um, health authorities setting it up and doing that kind of work. So, so I feel like I very much had my uh, my public health hat on for a little while, but to, to dip back into the, the anthropology and the social science of it all, yes, absolutely, um, especially around all of the discussions that people were having with um, uh, you know, that Order 200 and expanding MAT treatment, that's, Order 200 was when the Ministry of Health sort of recoiled and was like, mm, let's make this really hard to get access to so we can kind of whittle down the program and make it something um, that we might be able to afford. That's at least the um, the common knowledge about the motivation uh, or common understanding about the motivation between, behind Order 200. I don't believe anyone ever openly um, made that statement. But when the HIV AIDS Alliance was um, in communication, and this is covered a lot in chapter four of the book, there, there was a huge amount of correspondence between um, various individuals in the Yanukovych government and in the Ministry of Health specifically um, about this order and about how, uh, you know, sharing science behind it, sharing um, how, you know, they're saying like the Global Fund, this, this puts us in, you know, contravention of our, of our agreement with the Global Fund and they're going to pull all this money back. and. Um, the conversation that happened between those two individuals was so interesting in that the AIDS Alliance began presenting this as a human rights issue, right? And they're saying like, these are people, these are citizens of Ukraine. They need to have access to this medication. This is your, this is literally your job to provide these services and entitlements to citizens of Ukraine. Um, the government representatives would consistently write back saying, well, we have to balance the availability of this set of medications against the rights and safety of other citizens of Ukraine, of people of Ukraine who don't use drugs, right? And so it was a very clear distinction being made about there's, there's the people who use drugs and then there's the people who are really here to serve, right? And so the government itself was framing its own conception of the boundaries of citizenship of Ukraine in such a way that drug use and drug users were opposed to it, right? So, so, so they're not just, they're not, treating drug users like citizens, they're in fact saying drug users are something that threatens the people who are really citizens. Um, the same thing I believe happened in, in Crimea, unfortunately. So um, the, you know, the sad truth is there's a number of people in this book who, um, who appear in this book who are no longer with us because they uh, lost their lives to overdose, um, some to suicide following the closure of all of the methadone programs in Crimea after Russia illegally annexed to the peninsula. Um, in Russia, they have a very regressive public health policy around substance use. Um, also, their you know HIV epidemic is off the charts, um, and it's and it's a very um, it's a very oppressive place to try to do public health work with vulnerable people. So even though methadone and buprenorphine are two of the most evidence-based treatments for opioid use disorder, they are life-saving. Like period. They protect against death in so many ways. Um, they extend life. Um, they're, they're really, really marvelous, effective medications. Uh, both of those medications are illegal in Russia. Not simply illegal to prescribe for opioid use disorder, but it, one is not even allowed to import them. Right? They're, they're just seen as inherently bad because the only thing they're good for is being a drug that replaces another drug for addiction. All, all of those stigmatizing myths about how, how medication works. So after Russia annexed the peninsula, um, we saw them doing all these really interesting things. And I'm sure you've had a lot of really interesting conversations with other sociologists and political scientists about, you know, changing the money and changing the flags. And, you know, even the brands of, of wine that were in the, the Produkti were, were changing and, and all of these performative things to be like, now this is a Russian place, right? Um, among the many, many things that they did in that sort of uh, like shock transition into Russianness, so to speak, was close the methadone clinics because methadone clinics are very 
un-Russian places in that sense. Um, they did not have to do that, right? The, um, there were 800 people in Crimea at the time of the annexation who were stabilized on medication. Um, the, and it, so the invasion happened in February, the illegal annexation in March. Um, by May 2014, methadone clinics were shut down with almost no notice. And that came a few weeks after the person who was then the head of the Russian Drug Control Service, Viktor Ivanov, said that people would be allowed to stay on their medication through the rest of the year. Um, and that if you are going to do something as ill-advised as shut down methadone clinics, giving people a long window is the most advisable way to do that unadvisable thing, if that makes sense. Like people need time to make a plan, to transition, um, and, and leaving treatment cold turkey like that is actually really dangerous because this is a relapsing disease. Um, and when you go back to street drugs, it's very easy to overdose because your tolerance has changed and you know street drugs don't come with an ingredients list. So more than 100 people died in the weeks following that shutdown. And what was incredible to me was not, this was not just you know, cleaning up the administrative, um, you know, like the paperwork side of government. This was performative. This was part of their political theater of making things, um, you know, a Russian place just as much as having um, uh, Medvedev out there, like shaking hands with people receiving Russian passports. One of the things that they chose to do was incinerate the remaining stocks of methadone on the peninsula. So, so drugs that could have literally kept people alive. Um, and they had journalists there. We have photographs of this moment when Russian guy in, in, I mean, literally carrying rifles and looking like they're ready to like storm out of some trenches, um, very overdressed Russian police officials, uh, just, just delicately throwing bags and bags of prescription medication into an incinerator. And I remember seeing this and saying, why, why do we have pictures of this? Right. Why are we able to know what the scene looked like? Why was anyone interested in going to garbage day outside of a clinic? Clearly, they were invited there. Right. They were invited there to see tough looking men in riot gear, literally killing by flame the remaining, you know, uh, medications and, and like the remaining bits of this particular program. So so the argument that I make is that. Russia tried to establish sovereignty over Crimea by doing things that only the sovereign can do, which is creating the exception, right? That notion of the sovereign exception. The sovereign gets to decide who is a citizen and who is not a citizen. That's one of the most basic fundamental definitions of what a sovereign power is. And so by redrawing that line very clearly um, by and, and redrawing it in such a way that excludes a certain group of people that had previously been enfranchised, um, it's sort of a, it's, it's more political theater. It's a show of power. It's gaining sovereignty by literally filling the part, you know? So, so this to me was an act of state building in a way, um, by redefining the citizenry against people who use drugs and simply not caring that the, you know, side effect of that particular action was, um, a hundred people unnecessarily losing their lives. Russia's, yeah, Russia's public health policy around substance use um, pretty much amounts to tell those jerks to knock it off. And if they won't knock it off, throw them in jail and let them rot there. Um, I cannot speak to the Baltics, um, and I have a, a very strong suspicion that public health policy around substance use in the Baltics is going to be much more um, progressive and in line with the the current evidence base. Um, but uh, but not being a Baltic expert, I can't I can't speak to that. That's that's just my strong suspicion. Um, but when it comes to especially the CIS countries, um, yes, it it actually is Ukraine because even though there has been um, a fair amount of, of heel dragging and nimbyism and social pushback, I mean. I live in North Carolina. We have that here too, honestly, right? Like we're, there are still places in the United States where folks are struggling to keep syringe access programs open, which is, which is the most, like that's literally how you stop HIV epidemics is having syringe access. And did, did we all forget what happened in Scott County, Indiana a couple of years ago, right? Um, where, what was it like a hundred or 200 people in a population of 4,000 got HIV after they shut down their syringe exchange. Let's, so let, let's be real about what works. These things really, really work. They're terribly effective. Um, they're essential public health programs and, and there's pushback everywhere. So I don't think that Ukraine is unique in the fact that, um, there's a lot of, 
lot of stigma, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of, of fear and discontent around um, doing things that make space for activities that are already happening around us, make space for them to happen um, more safely, right? It very, very much mirrors a lot of the, do we teach children sex ed or do we teach them abstinence kind of conversations, right? Um, but the fact that Ukraine has made space for some of these treatments to be available at all, even if they are not available um, at sufficient capacity, um, the fact that uh, we have such strong um, advocates, um, such intelligent people uh, behind the counter or behind the desk at some of these organizations. Um, you know, and this is why I started doing more and more research in Ukraine is because I was so deeply impressed by the people that I met there. Um, my first visit to Ukraine was actually when I was getting a master's degree at Central European University um, in Budapest. Um, I made a visit to, as I mentioned, that, that little organization in Odessa that astonishingly seemed unimpressed by the nuisance of a foreigner who barely spoke the language <laughs> shadowing some of their staff for a while. And I learned so much. I learned so much that it took me months to process everything that I learned. Um, and, and, and I don't just mean I learned how to take the marshrutka. I mean, the individuals applying these programs in Ukraine were thinking about them in ways that were new and, and innovative. Um, and I, I just, I just said like, I cannot, I cannot stop visiting these people and hearing them talk and writing down what they say. You know, that's, that's just not, not the best use of my time is doing anything else. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think Ukraine really, really is a very, very strong leader um, as a result of the, the fantastic um, efforts that many, many people have made. Um, on the other end of the scale, you have places like Russia, where, um, you know, I actually had came across at one point a scholar who had fled Russia um, and was actually being supported by various refugee scholarship programs um, because she had dared to support um, uh, research that was piloting syringe access in Russia. Right. Um, then there's Orban in Hungary, who is a real piece of work um, and has been ba basically mirroring all of Russia's policies. Um, there was a really effective and wonderful uh, syringe access and harm reduction program in Budapest called Kekpont or Blue Point. And um, he shut that down very, very quickly, um, which is which is a, a, an incredible shame. There's a, a fantastic harm reductionist in Hungary named Peter Sorosi, who or Sharoshi, I believe it should be, um, who uh, runs a, a website and blog called Drug Reporter, um, and he does an excellent job covering these issues across Eastern Europe, um, especially in Hungary. And it's it's kind of devastating some of the rollback that we're seeing. It's it's unfortunate when the churn and, and like the, the political pendulum that goes back and forth between progressive and conservative politics really catches the most vulnerable people in them. We're always going to have that kind of bounce back reactionary politics, the conservative prime minister and then the progressive prime minister and then, you know, back and forth. Um, but when that pivot turns on and off different entitlements that people have or opens and closes certain doors to evidence-based medication, to healthcare, to the ability to live safely without harm, um, it can be really, really devastating to watch. And I think that, that um, many things are at that nexus, but, but healthcare services for people who are in any way touched by substance use are very, very much at that nexus. So, so this, you know, those, Gosh, you know, f fingernails are splinter splintering on the tiny little grip that 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 community and its allies has to to the resources that they need to be safe. Um, and, and and yeah, little 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 bitty rocks in the boat can can have enormous impacts on the population. The major argument that I make in the book is that even though this seems like a very fringe social issue, it's really not because. As I mentioned before, you know, I would, I would come to Maidan, I, 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 as I mentioned, I lived on uh, near Polot Ukraina and was about two kilometers away from the Maidan encampment as the whole revolution was happening. And I spent most of my days there um, talking to people, taking pictures, recording what was happening. And, and I was really astonished the degree to which, you know, the imagination of people who use drugs was evoked in order to um, make sense of the us-them dynamics, you know. So... The, the Berkut were calling 
um, Maidan protesters, Narkomani. Maidan protesters were calling anti-Maidan protesters Narkomani. Um, you know, Russian media was calling everybody in Kiev Narkomani. Um, there was even, uh, just like the Orange Revolution, when there was a... Uh, um, and various allegations that everyone there was on drugs. And so people kind of made that um, uh, absurd protest of like syringes and oranges and <laughs> things like that. It was happening at, at my band as well. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's interesting that, that that trope appears again and again and again. That trope gives buoyancy to so many um, political narratives about my band and about Europe and about Ukraine and Russia. That trope um, was very viciously and lethally invoked by Russia in um, in Crimea when they tried to sort of reestablish um, their their sovereignty in the area. And then narcomania and the idea, the imagination of narcomania of people who use drugs was also really really central to the war in the East. Because when I started visiting places um, like eastern urban centers like Kharkiv in 2016 after the war had been um, raging for quite a while. People were still talking about how the entire war could be blamed on people who use drugs. You know, it, so the Slavyansk, for example, why was Slavyansk chosen by Girkin or any other Russian operative as the place to create the headquarters of the first um, uh, separatist, you know, nonsense? Uh, well, the idea is that that's because, as everyone knows, Slavyansk is allegedly on um, a major intersection of, of a drug trafficking route, and all of the leaders are corrupt, and drug use is rampant, and everyone is a narcoman or, or is a narcodealery or something like that, and so therefore they were open to corruption, and at some point Igor, uh, you know, Girkin was um, caught saying something like, oh, we knew that they were prepared. I think the word he used was like gotovi, like they were they were kind of ready for us to come, and people were like, mm, yeah, he's talking about the drug users in town. And so drug use in particular is is seen as this weak link in the chain, and had there not been drug users in Slavonsk, there's you know people in Ukraine today who believe that there would never have been a separatist war in the first place. So... I think it does seem drug use and HIV does kind of seem like a fringe social issue, but I, the the argument that I try to make is that it's actually much much more central to the most basic political ideas in Eastern Europe um, than than we want to give it credit for. Um, I think that it it evokes a very similar imagination as uh, immigrants are right now in the United States. It's a sort of catch all for. Um, it's a signifier that we can pack all different kinds of values into, and it does a ton of political and symbolic work. Um, and so I just hope that um, I'm able to, you know, pull the curtain back on that a little bit and, and help people recognize how prominent that particular discourse is in um, contemporary politics of the day. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity, and I love your channel, by the way. So I, I've, been, I've been looking at so many of your videos, and it's, you do really delightful work. So. Thank you for this.